We will be starting tonight's webinar here in about two more minutes, impacting soil during the winter with bell grazing. Well, we'd like to welcome everyone here this evening for tonight's webinar, Impacting Soil During the Winter with Bell Grazing. This presentation tonight will be given by Jeremy Sweeten, a consultant with Understanding Ag, and Kent Solberg, another consultant with Understanding Ag. So if you have questions throughout the webinar, make sure you put them in the chat for the Q&A session, and we will address them once the presentation's done this evening. So Jeremy, Kent, I'm going to turn it over to you guys and allow you to inform us about winter bell grazing. Okay. Good evening. Thank you for um, attending this this evening. Um, like Shane said, my name is Jeremy Sweeten. I farm in northern Michigan, um, eastern upper peninsula near Sault Ste. Marie, or more of a geographic reference would be the east end of Lake Superior. And um, we raise cow-calf pairs and stalker cattle, and we're grass-fed and grass-finished all the way through. And we've been bale grazing um, our animals out on pasture since 2017. Um, I'd like to introduce my my partner in crime here, Kent. Um, if you'd like to tell a little bit about yourself, Kent. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Kent Solberg, I am up in Northwest Minnesota, another consultant with Understanding Ag. We've been bale gra I've been bale grazing for 25 years, and I, I do want to acknowledge the two farmers that I learned how to do this from. It was from uh, um, Art Tickey, who was a dairy farmer in Southeast Minnesota, and Ralph Lenz. They were neighbors. Uh, Ralph was a uh, beef operator, and uh, they spent a lot of time back in the 90s running around teaching folks how to do this. And uh, we're great. It's it's exciting to see this catch on. And we'll hopefully uh, give you some more trips, tips and tidbits and information uh, that will help reinforce using this technique on your own farm or ranch. So, and I want to take a, a deeper dive into this. There's a lot of presentations from the past that talk about the mechanics of, of how to bale graze, the impact that it has on animals. Um, but I also want to look at the soils um, after the bale grazing. So we're going to go ahead and get started. And <clears throat> understanding ag is completely in the regenerative agriculture field. And um, I just, I, I want to start us all off on the, the same level. And regenerative agriculture is simply farming and ranching in synchrony with nature to repair, rebuild, revitalize, and restore ecosystem function starting with all the life in the soil and moving to life above the soil. So I want us to keep that in mind as we're going through this presentation that we're always trying to figure out ways to improve our soil, which will have a, a compounding cascading positive effect on everything else we do. So I, I pose the question, can we add carbon in the winter to rebuild and restore our soils? Um, both Kent and I are at the 46th parallel, or just a little further north of that, and we like to say that we have seven to eight months of winter and four to five months of hard sledding. So 
we don't have a long extended grazing season. And so we have to figure out ways that we can, we can utilize um, what we have to build our soils, even when it's not the growing season. So some of our objectives tonight um, are to equip you to use your forage and livestock to positively impact soil, whether it's during the growing season or not. We also wanna help you try to reduce some inputs, um, help identify some of those low hanging fruit um, that could help increase profitability. And we also wanna change how you look at outwintering livestock. Um, you know, many farms like to have livestock on feedlots or concrete during the winter. We wanna change the perception of that. So we also wanna put this in your goals and context and determine how and where and when to utilize bale grazing on your your operation. And I, I really want to encourage folks to um, help overcome the, the statement that I hear so often is, well, that won't work here. Um, I hope through explaining and helping you evaluate your context that this will give you some, some different views on, on how to do this. So, anything you'd like to add to this, Kent? Okay. So there's some purpose with bale grazing, um, especially from a regenerative point of view. Um, we would like to positively impact the soils and forages with animals, carbon, and nutrients. So we want to get use our hay residue from bale grazing, the manure and urine, to positively improve our soils and get carbon back in the landscape. Um, we also want to try to use this use bale grazing to restore our lower um, nutrient areas. Um, or damaged areas, um, but bale grazing can also be used to enhance high performance areas. So as we go through this, we'll, we'll show you more of that. The other interesting thing is that we can use bale grazing as a planned disruption for a break in the quote unquote normal cycle that you have um, of summer grazing. So, and finally, we would like to talk some about reducing inputs and labor expenses Manure handling, um, help reduce some expenses with um, extra added inputs such as fertilizer. So, at Understanding Ag, we, we really work with the 634. So, the six principles of soil health, the three rules of adaptive stewardship, and the four ecosystem processes. The six and the three really drive the four. And you know, if you're interested in that, that's a whole separate conversation. Um, and either our website or YouTube channel, there's a lot of information on the 634 and you can look at that. We're not gonna go real deep into that tonight, but there's certain things that this bale grazing presentation is gonna pull out. And in the six principles, we're really gonna look at context, increasing soil armor with using hay residue and manure, and also having live, livestock impact um, almost year round, if not year round. So the three rules of adaptive stewardship, the, the parts we really wanna focus on in there is a, an intentional disruption. So that bale grazing in the winter um, is a great disruption to the, to the normal cycle. And we also wanna look at the compounding cascading effects. There's either positive or negative, there's never a neutral effect and there is never one singular effect. So we really wanna focus on those positive parts of the compounding cascading effects. And then, then the four ecosystem, ecosystem processes, we're gonna look really at the energy cycle or carbon cycling, um, which is gonna influence the water cycle and the nutrient cycle as well. So our goal is to really kickstart the energy cycle with bale grazing. So during bale grazing, we're gonna add carbon to the system, to the pasture. We're gonna use that with hay residue and manure. Um, this in turn will stimulate plant growth um, in the following seasons. So that plant growth then is gonna have more leaf area, which is gonna capture more sunlight, which then is gonna increase the amount of root exudates that support the soil biology and soil aggregate development. So let's get into the context of 
most farms on their winter feeding. Um, you know, outwintering is there's different levels of it, anywhere from stockpiled pasture all the way to feedlot. And we rank these in order of the equipment inputs. So anytime you start putting more and more equipment between your livestock and the feed that they're eating, there's an increased cost. And so if we can save some of that increased cost, that's more money in your pocket. Um, and really the bale grazing is gonna be tonight's focus. So I just wanted to bring this up to, to show different examples of what could be done. So first off, we really want to evaluate your context on your farm. What is your situation? What do you want to accomplish with bale grazing? What do you want to accomplish with your livestock? What type of, of livestock do you have? What size are they? What class are they? Are they heifers? Are they bulls? Are they steers? Are they mamas with calves on them? Um, what are your equipment resources? Are, do you have a, a full shed of equipment that you can utilize um, for moving bales and things like that? Or are you the, the custom grazing guy that has a rented skid loader for two weeks out of the year? Um, I want to look at what your winter conditions are like because there's people from all over listening to this right now. And just because we have frozen ground in the north does not mean that the southern latitudes do as well. So winter conditions are very important piece of your context. And then something else to consider is what is your farm layout? So how can you best utilize your farm on whether the ground is frozen or not? How can you protect those animals from storms? Things like that. We're also going to talk a little bit about soil conditions and and back to the frozen ground again um, or you know well-drained soils so um, something else that comes to mind is what are your labor resources um, labor is important when it comes to time to place the bales and unwrap them and move cattle things like that in my case i've got four kids that like to fight a lot during the winter because they're stuck in the house a lot so unwrapping bales throughout the winter is a good job for them um, if you're a sole proprietor and you're it then you're going to approach this differently than I do. So really at the bottom of all this, your desired outcome really does determines the techniques that you're going to use. So some of our goals of bale grazing, um, ultimately, first off, I mean, the very obvious one is to feed livestock. That, that's our goal. But can we reduce our feeding and manure handling costs by feeding them out on pasture and then can we in turn use the manure and the residue hay to help build soil aggregation to kickstart that, that energy cycle? Can we capture more of the manure nutrients and shed biology from those animals on pasture versus a feedlot? So um, like I said, you know, and I'm making some repetitive points here that I really want you to take home. Can we have planned disruption with bale grazing? Um, bale grazing gives us an opportunity to grow those biological hot spots. So those areas where the bale and the cattle, the bales or the cattle were concentrated, that will trickle biology out through the remainder of the field and across the farm. The, the livestock impact on that soil, that hoof action, and the disturbance of the sod on top can help stimulate the soil seed bank and bring more diversity, more species into the system. So uh, another option is, is because you're importing hay onto those fields in, in the non-growing season, is that you can buy more mature hay with seed in it and import seed in your hay to help improve damaged or, or less than desirable areas. What we have seen from bale grazing is an improved bricks content in our future forage crops. So as those bale grazed areas start to produce feed for cattle, um, our bale or our bricks content has anywhere from doubled to tripled over the unbale grazed areas. We've also seen an increase in, in pasture yield. And again, it's been a two to three fold over the unbale grazed areas. So in my mind, that's like buying two or three more farms without cutting a check for a payment or paying taxes on it. So 
It's really important to have some type of mental goal, but written goals and records as you start into this and proceed are even better. Jeremy, just a comment on forage yield. Uh, I know NRCS and a few farms that have been doing bale grazing for a while have done flip plots uh, in subsequent years, and they consistently record two to four times uh, a two to four fold increase in, in forage yield for out to three, four, five, six years after the bale grazing occurs on there. And the differences are largely due to the amount of precip received the spring after uh, the bale grazing is completed. So yeah, you can really bump forage yields with this on that site. You know, and I would call that a very positive compounding cascading effect of doing that. <clears throat> so, you know, as we, I'm a firm believer in Murphy's Law. So anything that can go wrong will. So it's always good to have a couple different plans and maybe a backup plan on the back burner. Um, farms vary, weather varies. So it's always good to be very adaptive in your system. Um, for example, this year, we didn't have snow till the middle of January, which is or early January, which is almost unheard of. Last year, we had snow in the middle of this, of November, and that totally changed how we, we started feeding hay. We were able to graze stockpiled pasture up through Christmas. So um, different weather each year, adverse weather conditions. We're under a winter storm warning right now. So we have to adjust where we're feeding cattle to get them protected from this storm. Um, as the winter progresses, a cold snap coming up next week, you know, we have to look at different water sources and, um, you know, depending on the latitude, you know, different water sources than what you would use in the summer as well. Um, winter fencing techniques also change from summer fencing techniques. More grounds are required, maybe a ground wire is required. Um, we could do a whole presentation just on water sources and, and winter fence te techniques but we'll just very briefly touch on them here. Um, part of your planning should really include adjusting for hay quality based on outside conditions and also where you place it. So, you know, back up to those adverse weather conditions. And so as you're bale grazing in the winter, you know, there's still those effects from bale grazing that, that roll over into the spring and summer of the next year. So a pasture recovery plan is very important um, to work into that. You're not just going to come right back on that field and graze like nothing happened. So you, you need to have an extended recovery plan that fits in your system. Um, on your farm, it's really important to also identify some primary and contingency sites to bale graze. You know, we have areas we graze when the weather's nice, the ground's froze. We have areas we bale graze when the ground is unfrozen. We have areas we put bales when it's going to storm, depending on what direction the wind's out of. So having those, those sites ID'd as you get comfortable doing this is very important. And especially if you have multiple folks working on your farm with you, some type of a written plan is very helpful. Um, so everybody understands what's going on. You know, Jeremy, in 25 years of <clears throat> doing bale grazing and outwintering, I've I can count four times I've had to lean on my contingency plan. And I've extremely glad that I had it at the time. Uh, I always try and go into the winter with one, but I don't always need it, but it's still important to have that plan. Know what you're going to do if things get outside of the boundaries you typically expect to be operating in. So yeah, just go into it with that. Um, oftentimes what I'll do is place maybe 70% of my hay and keep 30% uh, back, 25, 30% back just as a backup. If I need it, I can always put it out in the spring after the snow starts to melt and we can get around again. But just having that contingency plan and thinking it through uh, just makes everything go a whole lot better. Yes, and and we also call this engineering on the fly. Um, a lot of times we only feed for a week to a month at a time because of the way the weather conditions vary between the amount of snowfall or if everything melts off and we have mud. So we don't like to lock ourselves in too far. Okay, so we mentioned winter water sources. I, I figured it'd be worth at least throwing one slide up there. 
um, because water is often a limiting factor for folks wanting to start bale grazing. Um, watering livestock in the winter is a little different than the summer. Um, you really need to look at what their water requirements are. Quite often, they're, they're way less than the summer um, in areas that get snow, um, quality snow, such as the, the lower right picture from Gabe. Um, animals can do quite well with their water intake coming from snow. Um, we utilize some of that on our farm here in Michigan, but we also get ice crusting or melt off and then the, the snow refreezes and the quality of snow is not that great. So we'll make our animals walk to a winter water and that's the upper left and the upper right picture that we're showing. And, you know, the upper right picture, it's 40 below zero that day and the water is still working just fine. So having a good solid water system makes your life go a lot better when you have animals outside like this. Um, another option is a continuous flow tank where water is continually coming in and overflowing and leaving the area. The water won't freeze. Um, the main thing is to keep those animals out of that overflow area so it doesn't become a mud hole. Um, another couple thoughts are uh, limited access to a flowing stream or field tile outlet. Those work really well for, for winter water if there's a, a good firm or frozen surface there for the cattle or the, the livestock to walk on. Probably the least desirable option is hauling water because it's, it's labor intensive. But if it's part of your backup plan, it, you know, don't throw that out. That's, that's still a good idea because sometimes it's easier to haul water to cattle or to livestock than it is to move them just to come get water for a few days if, if the weather changes or something happens in your, you know, an anomaly in your plan. You know, I learned to do continuous flow systems from some guys from Alberta, Canada. If they can make it work in temperatures like you're 40 below in your thermometer up there, uh, most of us in the contiguous United States can probably find some options down there. Now, this is not full flow. It's partial flow. For many people, that's 20, 25% of full flow coming through that valve. It just needs to keep moving. Thank you, Ken. Um, another factor to consider um, as you're, you're working on bale grazing is the class of livestock that you're going to have out there on pasture. You know, it, it really depends on your climate and your latitude. I mean, this is all back to context. My least favorite time to have livestock outside is 33 degrees and rain when their hair coats get soaked. Um, that netted energy of maintenance goes way up. Um, it really depends. Are you raising beef cattle or dairy or sheep or goats? Um, are, are the young stock weaned or not? Or um, are the cows still lactating? Are they dry cows? Are they replacement heifers? This is all going to vary how much hay they need and what quality of hay that they need. And temperature plays a big factor into that also. Um, and one factor that doesn't often get mentioned, but epigenetics of the animals on your farm are a huge deal, especially keeping them outside overwintering on pasture. Um, you know, are those animals adapted to your area? Are they adapted to your feed? Are they adapted to your management? Um, if they're not, you're going to struggle. So if I brought animals in from Kentucky right now and threw them out with my cows, there would be a definite loss of body condition because of that. So all this process takes observation. Um, you know, as you're setting this all up and implementing it, you know, sometimes we rush through life because we're always in a hurry, but if you can take just a little bit of extra time and look at the soil conditions, um, especially on unfrozen ground, can you look at the weather conditions coming up so you can plan better? What does the body condition score your animals look like as they progress through the winter? What does their hair coat look like? Um, some other things to look at in the field after the cattle have been fed and they've moved on to the next area. Um, what does the residue and manure distribution look like? And every so often, it's really important to ask yourself, are you achieving your goals? So, Jeremy, in the slide we have here, I'm, I'm assuming this is fairly early in the growing season. Do you have any concerns uh, about the what we're seeing there, the level of disturbance around where those bales were? 
I'm not seeing any concern. I'm actually very pleased with how this looks. Um, this was an area of the farm that we fed round bales at a fairly high density late in the, the bale grazing season. Um, so the ground was fairly soft and the animals pugged it up a little bit. Um, but as you can see, there's a flush of legumes coming in and you can tell where the high fertility areas are at and that hay residue, um, we'll talk about it later. And um, that hay residue is not a problem. So you're talking here a little bit about body condition and hair coat and things like that. Just a comment on, you know, you had some other classes of livestock in the last slide. You know, sheep, great outwintering option. Uh, they, they come with a wool coat, you know, a wool sweater. Uh, they can do absolutely great out on snow. In fact, their water requirements are pretty small. Um, also, uh, personally, I in the northern climates, I like to not go below 600 pound calves uh, that aren't still on the cow um, during the winter. If they've been weaned, um, I, I think we get, you know, those four weights, five weights, they tend to struggle a little bit if they're not a mama. So you may, they may need a little extra TLC on something like that. And some of the dairy breeds that tend not to keep body condition uh, on very well, you're going to want to keep a real good eye on them. Um, We've, we've seen some Holsteins that are lactating and jerseys that are lactating struggle a little bit uh, on that. And so uh, they might need a little TLC or a little something extra to make this work. But that doesn't mean it can't work for dry cows, far out dry cows, or for those bred heifers. So uh, I've done this for dairy in dairy for years. The University of Minnesota uh, has done it with dairy for almost 30 years, outwintering them. Derek uh, Schmitz, one of our other consultants, done it for years. So it can be done. Uh, you just got to think, as Jeremy said, through that class of livestock and what are their needs going to be. And, and, you know, another comment would be, um, is that you might have some animal fallout for some animals that don't handle this quite as well. So, uh, you know, that's important. Um, and that's for your epigenetics that. and growing your epigenetics. So. Yeah. Yes. And, and these animals in this picture off our farm a week or so ago, um, and there's three different classes here. There's the mama cows with the green ear tags. The white ear tags that you can see um, are the, the calves that were born in late summer, early fall of 23. So those, those calves are on the cow all winter, plus the cows are now bred back. And then the purple ear tags are the year and a half old replacement heifers that have also been exposed to the bull. So in looking at those, I, I looked that they're, they're in good body condition. They have clean hair coats. Their hair coats are, are slick um, and, and fuzzy. It, it's very uniform. So they're doing well on pasture there. So um, something else to consider is the shelter for the animals. I mentioned earlier in this presentation, we have a winter storm coming in. Um, I was talking to Alan just before the, the presentation started, and we're going to move hay tomorrow um, on the west side of our woods because the storm is coming out of the east, and our primary concern is the wind. It's not the cold temperatures, but it's, it's really trying to reduce the velocity of the wind. So at least for our place, we try to use topography and natural wind breaks. If you're in a part of the world that doesn't have trees or the topography isn't conducive for, for stopping the wind, um, artificial structures work well. And then the question also becomes whether or not to put bedding out for those animals. So we're going to talk through a couple of those options. So this is an artificial windbreak. Um, it's not solid. It's designed to reduce the wind velocity with 70 to 75% solid there, but 25 to 30% of opening. And, you know, this is not a barn. Animals will do fine if they can have good feed, good water, and they can keep that wind velocity off of them. Yeah, these, these, the engineering for these artificial wind breaks came out of the Northern Plains, North Dakota, Montana, Saskatchewan. Um, I believe it's Saskatchewan Department of Ag has some really good examples of how to build uh, portable uh, artificial windbreaks, but we want to avoid solid. When we have a solid windbreak, we get an eddying effect on the downwind side. This 70-30% this uh, opening here um, creates an effective reduced wind velocity four times the height of the fence downwind 
uh, from where that fence is. If this is solid, we get that edding on the downwind side, and but we will have some lifting on the upwind side, but it's a very narrow window, so you can't get a lot of animals in there. And so it's not real. A solid wall is really not that effective. I, I know people who have them. They regret they put them in. They actually find their animals move to other areas on the farm when it's extremely windy uh, in order to get out of the wind, out of that wind velocity. We don't want to completely stop it, just reduce it. All right. Thank you, Kent. Um, a couple options for bedding. Um because I don't like to put money into straw and it's in my part of the world, it's actually kind of hard to locate. Um, we let the animals bet on the hay that they're being fed. And this works really well, especially on frozen ground or dry ground because the animals don't trample that hay as they're consuming it. They don't trample it into the soil. Um, so this really serves twofold. I mean, there's obviously a little bit of manure in here that, that ends up on the hay, but they eat around that. And, um, it's not a big deal. But if you notice um, some of the pictures, the calves are exceptionally haired up on the bottom half of their body and they're well suited for laying on that hay and, and being happy during the winter. If you've got lactating dairy cows and you're doing this, a lot of people, especially in some sub-zero temperatures, will opt to bed uh, those animals uh, out of the wind. If you got small fall calves uh, on those animals, they may opt to bed during sub-zero temperatures. So they have a place, as you can see in these animals here, to nestle down in. It really helps them keep a lot warmer if you're going to have extended period of sub-zero weather. And so, again, it depends on the class animals. It depends on your context. depends on the uh, your, just your whole situation there on if you want to bed or not bed. It doesn't have to be every day all the time. It can be a part-time deal. Um, there are some dairies that bed on a regular basis just for the cleanliness, and there's others who only bed when they need it. And, you know, Kent, that brings up a good point, um, talking about moving our cattle to the, the west side of the woods to break up the wind. We can always feed some very low-quality big square bales, and the animals will rub on them and push them apart and bed in them, and that's some pretty inexpensive bedding, especially if we're going to get a bunch of snow and wind, and it just helps offset the, the stress that that storm causes. You know, if our goal, if our primary goal here is to get carbon back on the soil, if it's to boost nutrient cycling, this is where we want our animals lying down. We want them laying on that hay residue because what's she going to do when she stands up? She's going to stretch, she's going to poop, and she's going to pee. And we want to be capturing that nutrients in this carbon diaper, if you will, but we're going to continually be moving it. We're going to provide new bales and we're not feeding back in the same spot. We're moving across that site there. We're intentionally doing this. We're constantly providing fresh bedding for them in a scenario like this, uh, if we're doing it well. So it's, it's not like we're all dumping everything right here, like you see in the picture. It's constantly on the move. We're constantly putting fresh bedding or offering fresh bedding with those new bales that we open up in front of them. And, and, you know, I think another key thing about bedding is if you look at the animals and they're starting to get muddy and manure clinging all over them, there's some type of bedding needed. If they're clean, like the ones in this picture, um, then they're utilizing the hay that they're being fed pretty well as dual purpose as bedding and as feed. So, um, one thing I want to talk about as we get in more into the methods of bale grazing is stockpiled pasture is integral with bale grazing. So stockpiled pasture is nothing more than mid to late summer growth on pasture left for fall or early winter grazing, or, you know, the further south you go, um, that can be all winter grazing. So why we do that is the animals continue to harvest high quality feed without any mechanical inputs. Um, they trample what plant material they don't eat down into the soil surface, so there's more carbon being added. It helps support those animals on unfrozen soil and even equipment if you have to feed. And what I like is when we're still stripping this off of poly wire, the calves can squirt under that poly wire and get ahead of the cows and get better feed. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, a low-tech way of creep feeding those calves. And really, this is just part of a long-term adaptive grazing plan. So first off, we're going to, we're, we're switching gears here, and we're going to talk a little bit more um, on the mechanics of bale grazing. So we're going to talk about low impact first, and there's a couple different ways to do that. Um, so you have 
almost all the hay consumed and the only thing that is left is trampled stockpile or um, manure and urine or very little hay residue. So bale unrolling accomplishes this. Strip grazing those unrolled bales with poly wires is a, another way to do it. Um, low density bales per acre. So we're talking two, three, four, five, six bales per acre, um, not a real thick mat of hay. So um, forage quality also plays into how much hay those animals are going to consume, um, especially with baleage. So to keep that low impact, you really need to spread those animals out, spread those hay bales out, and decrease the animal duration and density per acre. So um, this is really important on unfrozen ground, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But if you're trying to bale graze or wanting to bale graze on hay fields or um, row crop fields to get some nutrients back in the system, get some carbon cycling, this low impact is a great way to do that. Yeah, and uh, hay or crop fields, typically the rule of thumb is we're probably going to unroll everything. Uh, where if we're going to be on a pasture situation or even hay ground that we're going to start using as pasture, we can do the bale grazing because there are, is going to be some ba uh, bale residue out there. And if we're going to be running equ planting equipment through there, if we're going to be running haying equipment through there, sometimes that residue can be a, a bit of a headache. And so we want to use the right technique to fit, fit the context where we're doing this in. So more about bale unrolling. Um, interestingly enough, it can be done in the summer. Um, we generally think about doing it in the winter, but it provides a way um, to extend pasture rest periods in the summer. Um, like I said before, you know, you can strip graze those bales, those unrolled bales off with poly wire, which is a nice way to keep the, the animals, um, just keep their heads in it and, and not manure and urine on it. Um, it's just a really good way to improve bale grazing impact um, with good nutrient distribution, but not a lot of residue. So the, the question always becomes, how do we bale graze on unfrozen ground? Um, you know, we have a pretty good deal in the northern latitudes of the ground generally freezes up, but even southern Michigan, um, on down, the ground doesn't always freeze up and that it can be a constant source of heartburn um, for folks trying to bale graze. But um, Greg Halick from the University of Kentucky has done quite a bit of work with this and he will stress over and over that it's animal density or bale density per acre and the amount of time or the duration that it's left on there. Um, two to five bales per acre on good stockpile will generally help hold the animals up on the soil surface and it's important to run a back wire then to keep those animals from going back where they've already been. Um, Greg actually had a pretty good article in the December um, Hay and Forage Grower magazine if you want to take a look at that. Um, he talks about this more. This is another hot topic among bale grazing um, proponents is whether or not to use bale rings. I'm going to be flat out honest. I'm not a fan of them um, in my context. I think there's certain places that they are usable, but at the expense of five rings for 50 animals, I mean, we're looking at two to $4,000 to buy those rings. And as you well know, if there's bale rings out there, cattle are going to rub them, crunch them, break them. Somebody's going to drop a round bale on the side of them and tear them up. It's just something else that requires extra labor to move or and equipment, and they rust, rot, depreciate, and fall apart. So the question really is, is that hay savings worth it? Um, from running bale feeders versus um, bale grazing, just putting bales out on pasture, it seems like the hay that is left in the bottom of the bale feeder is the same hay that the animals are bedding on and trampling into the soil. So when hay is worth a hundred bucks a ton of nutrients, and we'll go over that in a little bit, um, it seems pretty worthwhile to leave a little bit out there rather than trying to worry that they clean it all up. So one tool that we do to negate this a little bit of not using bale rings and seeing those piles of hay out there is on a nice day um, when the animals are, are relaxed and 
you know, the sun's shining, the wind's not blowing, they're not under any stress. We'll make them go back through a bale grazed area and clean it up. And it's amazing how well those cattle will pick through all that hay that they they walked off from the first time when they got opened up to new bales. So, um, Ken, you want to talk about that picture on the right? Yeah, in the picture on the right, that is a bale of baleage, an individually wrapped bale, not a tube line wrapped bale. And uh, what was done here is there was an X cut on the end of that bale and it was peeled down about four or five inches down the side and it turns that bale wrap into its own individual bale feeder. And you, yes, you do have to go around and clean these up in the spring. Uh, pick them up in the spring, but it works amazingly well. And so if you're someone who's doing individually wrapped baleage, uh, this is how you can uh, systematically feed this out. I, I just to comment on on bale rings, you know, if if you're feeding three or four or five head for some reason and you're feeding large squares, there may be, you know, a time and a place to use some bale rings, but for our typical cow calf and many of our dairy operations or for feeding replacement heifers or whatever, um, bale rings tend to just, as Jeremy said, bring in more labor and extra cost. And if we're working on profitability, do we need that cost? And if our hay is worth hundred dollars an acre or hundred, excuse me, a hundred dollars a ton in nutrients out there, um, it's going to take a while for those bell rings to truly pay for themselves. And if our goal is to get carbon out of the landscape, um, it, it gets to be really hard to justify that expenditure of equipment, labor, and extra uh, materials to, to save maybe a little bit of hay. The other piece of this is, is can we do more if, if, if we feel we need to save, save hay because we're feeding hay five, six, maybe even seven months out of the year, we may want to start looking at other ways to extend our grazing season using stockpile forages, using covers, grazing corn stalks, whatever. Uh, some of those ideas that were on an earlier slide here to minimize the amount of hay that we, we need to feed and again, reduce even further the need for bell rings. Yes. All right. Well, thank you, Kent. Um, hey, Kent, real quick, I know you just muted, but um... In, in building this presentation, tell me the scenario you're feeding, you're using some bale rings at home and you're not. Can you walk through that in 30 seconds? Yeah, I got a small group of a couple, a couple, a few cows that I'm, that are getting fed some pre-purchased big square bales and they're getting, they're getting it hay rings just because it takes them, you know, four or five, six days to eat through that and minimize the laying on it. But it's just a small group of more special animals the bigger group there's no bale rings whatsoever um there is some individual bap, wrap baleage and they're being fed like you see it in the picture here that's how we're doing it um they're slicking most of that up and and the dry hay is just we just cut the net wrap off and they have at it okay thank you so you know after the the bale rings always becomes the question what about mud? What do I do? So, you know, having that plan, having multiple plans, having different areas on your farm is important. Um, back to the stockpile pasture, that does help support animal traffic. Aggregated soil helps support animal traffic better. Um, Brian Doherty, another consultant at Understanding Ag, um, in the fall of 23, did a, a similar webinar just like this, um, talking about soil compaction and aggregation and, and how aggregation really helps alleviate that and it, it supports equipment and livestock better. So, you know, that's if that's something that's a concern to you. Um, go look at his his webinar. It's on the YouTube channel. Um, in muddy situations, you know, that low impact bale placement, we're, we're back to spreading those animals out. Um, other options are, you know, do you have gravelly or sandy hilltops or knolls? Um, during unfro unfrozen conditions. So can you spread those animals out where the soil drainage is good and, and it's coarse enough soil or, or rocky or something that it's going to hold them up? The amount of time the animals are on the area um, is important. You know, reduce their density, spread them out. And I know we keep saying that, um, but, but that's really what it takes to circumnavigate the mud. Now, the other side of this equation is it really depends what your pasture recovery period is for the next season. 
So mud is not a bad thing if you can give it the proper recovery period after um, the, the really high impact is done. So uh, a story from our farm is in the spring of 2023 is we had cow calf pairs on it at melt off and because of some situations in life we had to be gone and those cattle were there a week too long in my mind we weren't able to move them out and spread them out and they were in mud up over their knees and I was pretty disgusted with myself and discouraged um when I looked at that paddock and I just walked away from it and we gave it almost um four months rest after they were on there. And then when we came back, the grass was anywhere from knee to waist high and so thick you could hardly walk to it. So you have to remember with the proper recovery, nature will fix itself and mud is not a big deal. You know, Jeremy, we have story after story after story. And and when I was first introduced to this concept, you know, over 25 years ago, Ralph Lenz had a, a slide back in the days when they had carousel slide decks they ran around with. Uh, he had a slide in there of a site uh, that was really tore up come spring. You know, the, the frost had gone out. Those animals were out there another six weeks before they started grazing. It looked like somebody went through that site with an offset disc. And, and people were horrified at what they saw. And then he showed a picture again of the exact same site uh, in mid-July. And it was just some of the most gorgeous forage on the entire farm and so yes nature is going to heal if we give it the rest it needs we want these impacts these disruptions to be acute we're not going back to the same site over and over every year and so giving it that rest uh it, it can be absolutely amazing like you said on what can happen yeah, I feel a little bit guilty now that I should have taken pictures of what in my mind was a train wreck, but it really was not, and then what the results were. So in the future, I'll take pictures. So shifting gears a little bit here again, um, we'll show some, some different pictures of some scenarios. This is December 11th on our farm. Um, this was stockpiled pasture. We had frozen ground and snow, and then it rained and it all turned to mud. So here we're simply spreading our animals out and reducing the number of animals around the bales. It was so soft out that if you look at the tractor tracks, we didn't even drive in the same track more than once because we didn't want to make a mess. When we moved those animals out of there to a different location, you couldn't even hardly tell that they'd been fed hay there because we fed good quality baleage. Um, they didn't pug it up. They didn't tromp it into the ground. Um, it was very minimal impact. So, um, the other end of the spectrum on bale grazing is high density. This is my personal favorite because of my context and our, the latitude that we're at and the frozen ground we get. We call it hay bombing. We'll feed 100 plus bales per acre. We'll coat a field with hay residue, manure, urine. Um, it's a pretty high impact area. And it really does work better on frozen ground. If you look at the right half of the picture, you can see that we fed hay through there. Um, we had rain come through and thaw everything out a little bit. They pugged up the soil surface, not a big deal. Um, we'll continue feeding um, on frozen ground just like this at a very high stocking density or uh, stocking density of bales per se. So um, this field, another picture of, of high impact hay bombing. And this field um, is the furthest from the old dairy barn on our farm. So everything on this farm was harvested, put in silos or the hay mow, fed to the cattle, redistributed back on the farm as manure. So this field is very nutrient deficient, very collapsed soil structure, um, low in carbon. So we fed a lot of low quality hay out here on top of the snow and wanted to leave a lot of residue. So, you know, you can't cover a lot of area that way, but it does have very good impact for multiple years after this. So those positive compounding cascading effects. Here's another picture of high density bale grazing. In this case, we were stripping it off with poly wire, giving them enough for a couple days at a time. And if you notice, there's some calves that are squirting under the hot wire there and they're eating the stockpiled feed and they're eating the better hay before the cows get to it. Um, an interesting story was in this situation is we had an ice storm come through and take all our poly wires down. 
and the cows turned themselves into a month of feed. And so what I thought was going to be a complete train wreck ended up being an interesting learning curve. And with all those bales out in front of them, the bales ended up lasting four or five days longer than what was planned. And that's because each cow kind of had her own bale and there wasn't the inner herd competition to eat feed before their buddy got it. So that was quite the um, learning experience. Most people would think that the opposite would happen, that if they had a month of feed, that it would be gone in three weeks. Well, we actually gained almost a week by turning them into that. We have a number of producers who do feed a month or longer at a time. When they drop the polywire or put bales out there, that's what they do. They're not out there every three, five, seven days. It's every 30 plus days uh, when they're doing it and it's working just fine. So we had talked about um, changing the impact with hay quality. And in this picture, we fed good quality bale silage. This was in our case, second cutting bale baleage um, of clover, trefoil and grass that we fed on top of frozen ground. And the only thing that is left there is manure, a little tiny bit of hay residue and a lot of staining just from the cattle trampling and moving that manure around. So, you know, if you wanna vary the impact, vary the hay quality. <clears throat> Another interesting thing you can do with bale grazing is you can push some bales into an area that you want to push brush back. You know, in our northern latitudes, it's tag alders and willows. And, you know, <laughs> I can definitely document that if it can be torn up, cattle can do it. And um, this is a great way to push brush encroachment back wherever you are. And consider the price of shoving that bale in there versus hiring a skid loader with a fecon head on it. You know, you're 100 to 150 an hour for that brush clearing, or you can do it for nothing with cattle. And the yeah, other thing got, is, oh, go ahead, Kent. I was going to say, I, I know a number of people who have used this technique to create savanna type scenarios in their pasture. It takes a few years to do it, but you just keep picking away at it and pushing back into it. You know, and the beauty of it is you open that canopy up, you add nutrients there, you could be adding seed there with more mature hay. Um, it, it's a win-win situation. So a little shift, um, we normally don't talk about bale grazing in the summer, but it can be a, a very valuable technique for building soils and forages. Um, you know, sometimes we're either given a drought or a flood where our normal pasture rotation doesn't work and we need to extend the rest period um, to maintain those forages that are still outgrowing. So a great way to slow that rotation down is to feed some hay or baleage out on pasture. Um, you know, sometimes we call it part-time grazing, but it's great to have a strategic plan and identify where those poor areas are at. So if this happens, you can come out, feed hay, and not um, disrupt the entire system and um, put your whole pasture system behind because you overgrazed it by grazing it too soon. So there again, just like the, the winter bale grazing affected areas, that rest and recovery plan is key um, to being successful with this. You know, in the past, you may have heard these areas, some may have heard these areas referred to as sacrifice areas. I, I don't need feel they need to be sacrifice areas. These are opportunity areas. If this is done well, and I've done this several times to move to part-time braille grazing because of other extreme factors out there, we can use this to repair sites. Uh, I had a sand, I've had sand blowout sites uh, that I've repaired doing this. Um, gravelly knobs, we've done this on. I know people that have restored uh, old gravel gravel pits uh, using things like this. So we can be real thoughtful in doing this and do a good job on it and actually turn it into a huge opportunity. But go into your grazing season knowing where you may want to do this if you get into that situation. Again, it may not be something you have an opportunity to do every year or need to do every year, but when you do need to do it, you've already got a plan in place. Yeah. Can't we use this um, on some of our ridges where the soils have been eroded away and we need to add organic matter or carbon back to it. Um, if we need to slow our rotation down a little bit, this is putting bales out there is a great way to do that. So we've gone through the reasons why we've gone through context. We've gone through um, the mechanics of, of bale grazing. So now we're going to do a little bit of show and tell. 
um, on this. So this was February 19th of 2023. We had a, a small three or four acre paddock that was on a hillside that had been highly eroded in the past from small grains production and overgrazing um, when this was a dairy farm. And, you know, our yield was less than a ton per acre for the season, which that's even poor for our area, um, where our county hay average is only 1.8 tons per acre for the year. So we we put 90 some cow calf pairs out there, 30 replacement heifers, and fed four to 500 bales on this three or four acre field. So this is, you know, this day this picture was taken, it was 20 below zero. Animals are doing great. This is May 11th. This is what it looked like after that. And, you know, the, the first initial reaction is to panic and go, boy, that's a lot of residue out there. No, that's not. That's great to see. That's all carbon going back in the soil. That is a good positive impact on the system, a good disruption. So um, the, the picture on the right, I just happened to stumble across it on an aerial photo, and it shows a two or three year history of our bale grazing on a different set of fields where you can see the grid pattern, the strategic pattern across those fields um, as things have unfolded and, we, and we've been bale grazing systematically. You know, Jeremy, for people who just start bale grazing, the, the number, the first year they do it, the number one question I get come spring is, you know, it looks like what we've got in the picture here and, the, and the, they call and they go, what do I do? What do I need to do? And the answer is nothing. And that's not what they're expecting. And, and that's not what they want to hear. They think they need to spread seed or get a drill out there, get a harrow out there. No, we let the biology and nature do the work here. And it does amazing things for us. We don't need to be going out and spending a lot of money on this site. So this next slide is about three months later. Exactly to your point, Kent, you can see all of the green area where all the grass has or the forage has taken off and it wasn't a very big area, but we sure fixed it. I mean, there's already double the yield that was there before. If you notice, there's a green line across here in the grass. I, I added a point, an orange line just to make this very obvious, but up on the edge of the hill, um, we couldn't get hay up there to bale graze because the snow was five feet deep. So, you know, we'll bale graze at a different time but you can see the dramatic difference between um, bale grazed and ungrazed. It tells a pretty great story. Another story, um, you know, May 2nd, 2021, we bale grazed these hillsides. We were very careful not to disturb the sod. So we did this all on frozen ground because we didn't want to promote any soil erosion. Two years later, here's the result. That's a pretty dramatic change. Um, the forage stand is completely even. There's more diversity there. Um, the yield is up across the board. The animals perform well on it. We actually, the growth was so nice that this was our turnout paddock for our stalker cattle after we weaned them off the mamas. So, you know, one of the questions I always get, Kent, or what is, what do we do with the residue left over from the hay? I don't worry about it. Um, you know, this paddock had been bale grazed. This is probably mid-June. Um, so the animals have been out of there for a couple months. The grass had been allowed to come back. And we turned cattle through there to eat what available grass there was. We only took the top third of the grass. And we had a fairly high stalking density, but they weren't on there very long. The, the goal of that was that the animals go pick through the old hay. They would There would be a lot of hoof action in that residue, which would stimulate the soil seed bank and help get new seedlings going. So we got them in, got them out, and you know that short duration and short intensity. So intermediate impact, um, as things progress, you know, those, those bale grazed areas where that residue was, there's gonna be a, a plant succession that happens. There's gonna, in at least in my experience, there's been a flush of, of broad leaves that come in, whether it's legumes or nitrogen loving, nutrient loving broad leaves. Um, but in this picture, you know, we had a big flush of legumes. So it's just the soil trying to armor itself. It's a succession. It's natural. Um, if you look in the picture, it's mostly Timothy orchard grass and smooth brome grass, all cool seasons. And in this bale grazed area, it's almost all 
legumes. So it's bird sweat, trefoil, alcite, clover, and medium red clover that came in. So now when I go to that spot in the field, there's still a few more legumes there, but it's predominantly grasses again. So that, that succession happens. You know, I think the biggest letdown I've ever seen on a bale graze site, and this happened to me personally, is we covered a site. It was beautiful. You know, we had carbon out there. We had even distribution of manure out there. We were so excited about what we were going to see. And then it stopped raining from March 31st, 31st to June 17th. And when you don't get rain in the spring, that's probably the biggest thing that can work against you here. We need that moisture for the biology. And, and if we don't get it, we don't, we can't control that. But that's usually where we have our greatest letdown. We can see some pretty amazing things when we do get the rain and we give time for recovery. Yep. And that's where it's really important to have those different contingency plans in place. So when that happens, you're not back on that area because you have to have the feed. So... Um, we'll talk a little bit here about long-term impact. Um, this is a year after bale grazing, but the important thing is we had four months of rest between green up and the end of the bale grazing and before it was ever grazed again. So the picture on the right shows how much forage was there on the, the height of the shovel is very dense. Um, the picture on the left shows what happened when we stuck a shovel in the ground. And what I see is the amount of soil aggregation above the orange line. So between the grasses and above the orange line, that has that fine chocolate cake texture to it. The soil aggregation is starting to happen, which we don't see that a lot in our, our heavy wet clay soils um, just because so much carbon has been removed over the, the generations of being a dairy farm. So in, in the middle here, there's still some soil aggregation starting to improve. The color's lighter, so there's not as much organic material there, but the soil aggregation is still happening. Now, the lower layer is very blocky, platy, um, collapsed structure. That's very traditionally what our soils look like around here. Um, so we are improving it. Bale grazing did help it. The other thing I really would like to point out is look at all the new grass seedlings that are coming in. We didn't add any seed to this. So those are young Timothy plants in this case that are coming in um, just as thick as can be. So that's gonna be an improved forage yield. So Ken, I'd like to ask you to talk through this. Um, we, we had two different bale graze locations that were within a quarter mile of each other. Um, the, the one year post bale graze was the pictures that I showed just before. The two year post bale graze was um, south of that location. It was on very poorly drained soil, um, but it, it's the same soil type. And so I just wanted to look at the differences because, um, you know, I never have. So these Haney soil tests show a lot. Yeah, we've got both Haney and PLFA here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this chart in the interest of time, and, and we're not here tonight to discuss those tests in great detail. But you've got, uh, uh, after the list of the analysis on the left there that was done, we have a list of target uh, ranges or, or thresholds we'd like to be shooting for, if at all possible, uh, in this. Um, and so you can see under percent organic matter, we're, we're way above target, way above what even are probably native to this area. And that's to be understandable. We just put a bunch of carbon out there. Organic, uh, inorganic end to end ratio, we're right in target. Uh, organic uh, carbon and parts per million, we're over target. We're in a really good range. Uh, we got a lot of respiration going on out there, maybe a little bit over what we want to see. But again, we just dumped a bunch of biology out there. And so we're probably going to see that. Same with microbially active carbon or percent MAC. Um, we're a little bit high. But again, we've just flooded this uh, system with a lot of nutrients and carbon. Our carbon nitrogen ratios right in the range. Um, our muscular microfile rhizofungi, our target should be around 6%. Uh, we're a little shy of that, but we're starting to move. We, we often don't see our muscular microfungi percentages in that four plus range. And we've got some of that one year post bale graze here and we're restoring that. Like Jeremy said, there's been a lot of carbon and disturbance on these sites over the years. Saprophytic fungi is what's really gonna feed okay. on a lot of that dead and decomposing uh, plant material out there. And so we're it's great to see that. Our fungal bacteria ratio, uh, on this test, we're looking for a 0 0.2 as our target range. Um, we're at uh, 0.125, but we're over two on the other one. So 
that one year post bail graze is looking pretty good. I understand from Jeremy that there was uh this, these were pulled in September and it had been dry for a while. That can have some yeah. impact on what's going on here, particularly on protozoa, which is at the bottom there. And just because you don't have protozoa in your test, in your sample, doesn't mean it's not there. We're sampling a very small area, but we want to see it being yes more than we see it no. And so this is this is a couple of years out. We want to continue to monitor this over time. We're seeing some good things happening on a site that was historically degraded here. It's part of the journey. We haven't arrived yet. We got a ways to go, but we're seeing some very positive things. Thank you, Kent. Um, I just want to encourage you to, to take observation of what's happening as you do all this. You know, we've talked about a lot of the things on the list, but the two things that are really important is one, stick a shovel on the ground, look at the soil aggregation. That's the proof in the pudding. The other is everybody has a mobile device in their hand, take pictures, Lots of pictures because you can reference a specific area or you can reference the year. And, you know, nobody's going to remember in multiple years, but that smartphone in your hand will keep track of that for you. You know, often I'm, I'm asked questions, you know, how long do I bail graze? How soon can I return to the site? Where do I go next year? It all depends. The goal is that you need to be adaptive to your situation. Um, another thing we talk about in this with the beauty of bale grazing is being able to reduce inputs, so reduce feeding hours. Can you pre-place those bales in the fall, um, especially if you're buying hay? Can your hay guide deliver them to you in the field and you just unload them? Um, natural wrapped twine round bales are great because you don't have to cut any net wrap or, or plastic twine off. Um, reducing equipment costs. Can you feed monthly, weekly, season long? Um, we, we talked about that earlier and the benefits of that. One of the hidden costs that guys don't oft, often think about are the true cost of operating equipment, especially in cold weather. That extra warm up time, the more fuel burnt, um, block heaters, heated shops, everything it takes to support that equipment. So, you know, what I really like about bale grazing um, on my reduced inputs is reducing or eliminating manure spreaders. Um, a manure spreader around here is almost a swear word because it seems like they always break down when they're loaded. And so we're to the point we don't even have one because the cattle spread it all for us. And ultimately we're capturing all those nutrients instead of using synthetic fertilizer. So captured nutrients are wonderful. Um, if you're on a feedlot, 80 to 95% of the manure nitrogen is lost um, between the field and the feedlot, you know, being spread as manure. Um, it's lost through leaching and volatilization. And up to 100% of the potassium is lost through leaching because all of the potassium is in the urine and it runs off with the water. So, you know, when cattle manure on pasture, 90 to 95% of the nitrogen and 100% of the potassium are captured, even in the winter. That warm urine will penetrate through the soil surface and it'll be held there in the soil because um, even though under that frozen surface, that soil biology is still working. The other beauty of this system is a lot of the nitrogen in the manure is tied to a carbon source already where the fiber that's left in that manure. So we talked about it earlier, we threw out the, the value of approximately $100 a ton in fertility. Um, this is from Jim Garrish in the Hay and Forage Grower Magazine. The column on the left shows how much nutrients are brought in with each ton of hay. And the column on the right shows how much N, P, and K passes through those animals um, as they process it and it's returned back to the field. So why wouldn't you want to feed hay out on pasture and capture all this and let the animals spread it themselves versus you having to take time and fuel and equipment to do it? So some final thoughts. Um, one thing we talk about is understanding ag is regenerative hay. And it seems like a little bit of a, an oxymoron because you are harvesting something and putting it in a package. But the idea is that you come back through and feed that hay on the same field um, in the winter. And whether that's in round bales that are just left in place, or in this case, big squares that are, are redistributed back out, you know, there's an extra step in the equipment there. But when you're making that hay, leave taller stubble to help protect and armor the soil surface from temperature and also leave leaf area on those plants so that photosynthetic engine stays running and there's um, not a drag in, in regrowth. 
Um, the haying process is the same. It's a planned disruption, just like the, the bale grazing is. Um, ideally, if you can minimize equipment traffic and inputs, it's going to be more profitable. And this is not intended to be on every hay acre every year. This is an every three or four or five year event. This is not an annual event to come in, hay, bale graze on the same field. So um, some other bale grazing benefits that I've seen is the increased bunk space. Those extra bales favor some of the timid animals. We have some cows that are really good cows, but they're not real aggressive um, when it's time to eat. So if there's multiple bales out there, there's ample space for them to eat and keep body condition and raise a calf. And it just makes everybody more comfortable. Um, improved animal health. They're not in a barn. There's not high ammonia content. Um, the wind is always moving or the air is always moving some way, somehow. And we see really, really good, healthy animals. Um, we've talked about this before, the, that improved forage yield, the improved bricks levels. But at the end of the day, through bale grazing, the soil aggregation, the increased mycorrhizal fungi, kickstarting that that carbon cycle and ultimately the nutrient cycling, we're producing more nutrient dense feed to feed our livestock with. Well, that more nutrient dense feed carries over into the livestock, which then provides more nutrient dense feed for us. So more healthier beef or, or mutton or whatever product you're raising on pasture. So our goal tonight is to help you build knowledge and understanding. Um, I know we're gonna go to questions here in a minute, um, if anybody is interested, I'm going to put a shameless plug in here for a soil health academy that's going to be on our farm in September. And you can go to soilhealthacademy.org and look that up. And so if you want to get your head wrapped around bale grazing and see it in person and see where there's residue and, and pasture regrowth and all that, you're welcome to come see us in September and be glad to have you. Um, at this point, Shane's going to talk a little bit about another couple upcoming webinars. So thank you for your time. Uh, great job, Jeremy and Kent, on tonight's presentation. But just to make the participants aware, we do have some other webinars coming up here in the very near future, February the 8th at 7 p.m. Central. We have the Power of Adaptive Grazing featuring Fernando Falemeyer. And also coming up in March the 14th, picking the low-hanging fruit by another consultant of Understanding Ag, Eric Fuchs. So you guys did such a good job with your presentation. We have a whole cadre of questions here for you. So we're gonna start off here from an anonymous attendee. What do you look for in residue and manure distribution? Jeremy. Um, I think it really depends on what type of impact you're wanting to have um, on those low impact bale unrolled areas. There might be just a few manure pats and a little bit of hay left on the soil surface. In the high density areas, there might be six inches of hay and manure left. What do you think, Kent? Yeah, it totally depends on your goals for the site. You know, I did a workshop here uh, last fall. It was a grazing workshop. I was part of a breakout session, and I had the breakout session on outwintering and bale grazing. And we had a farm, we we had every, the farm come into the, every, all the farmers come into the breakout session. We ran around and asked them if they were doing outwintering, if they're do, doing bale grazing, how they were doing it, what they were seeing and how it was working for them. And, and one of the best comments I heard was a guy came in and he said, it totally depends on where I'm at on the farm and what I'm trying to accomplish. He had one area where he, who was unrolling. He had another area where he was doing high density bell grazing because he had different goals for that site. So you got to think about your context and your goals and what you're trying to accomplish. So Kent, this question is for you. You mentioned tick for cattle that might be struggling. I think I mean tip for cattle might be struggling. I think it's TLC. Condition. I think it's TLC is what they mean. Well, my glasses may need to be cleaned off here, Kent. But <laughs> some animals <laughs> look like they need some tender, loving care. So how are you accomplishing that? Separating the animals, feeding differently, et cetera. Assume no barn, no calf. Yeah, it assumes it's it, it it depends again. It's the it depend it depends answer. 
depends on the class animals and what you're trying to accomplish. Um, I've done it with dairy outside. All I do is just make sure those lactating animals have bedding and plenty of bedding where I, I don't use that on dry cows. I don't use that on open heifers. Uh, we got Derek uh, Schmitz on here, another one of our consultants. He's a dairy farmer also. Maybe Derek wants to con comment on it. If I've got little calves there, uh, a roof over their head that they can get into, a place they can get into when it's wet, that 35 degrees. But, you know, we're talking less than 10%, maybe 15% of the days out there in the winter where we really have problems on average. And we can usually just modify things enough for them that they're comfortable and they get through it and everybody's fine. Derek, you got any thoughts? I agree with you with what you said, Kent. Um, if I know there's some miserable weather coming, I might unroll for peppers or dry cows or something, something a little better quality or maybe some extra bedding or something to cut them a break. But that's about it. Otherwise, they're on their own. Um, and they do fine. It's, it's really not a problem. You know, I would throw in too, like with our beef herd, we've had some fallout because some of the animals just don't cut at bale grazing. And, you know, call cows taste pretty good. They work well in the freezer as well. So Yeah, what's your what's your long-term goal? Where, where do you want to be? Where do you want your farmer ranch to be, you know, 5, 10, 15 years down the road? Do you want to be investing in brick and mortar infrastructure to take care of that small percentage of animals that aren't working in a system you want to do? Or are you you selecting four animals that do work in that system, building a strong epigenetic base, and and then being prepared for contingencies and the really harsh stuff, which is a small percentage of the whole year. So our next question is: If you're running a back fence or back wire while bell grazing, how are you supplying water, Jeremy? Um, a lot of times we'll either have a lane um to get back to the water. And we'll kind of vary the width of that lane depending on um, what the ground conditions are like. If they're froze up, then we'll we'll concentrate them on a, a tight lane. And if it's soft out, we'll try to make the lane wide. Or um, you know, usually if the ground's thawed out, it's warmer weather, and we can we can have some type of alternative water source. You know, usually a flowing tank or something. So, so Melissa has a question here in regards to baleage. Was net wrapped or twine used? And how did you address the existence or wrap or twine, especially wrap, when feeding within the open wrapped bales? Kent. The open like a tube line. I'm assuming the question's about tube line wrap bales. Uh, then I would play in the winter, I'll place out about a week at a time, five to seven days at a time. And then I just cut the net wrap and 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 plastic wrap off as I place them out there for the animals when I'm using that sort of a system. Um, yeah, I just take it off and haul it back and dispose of it. So can't, um, you know, the other thing I would think about is the picture of the bale on end. Do you roll that net wrap down with the plastic wrap as that bale gets fed or do the cattle yes. roll that down and not eat it? Well, you start it, you start it. Now that's an individual wrap bale. So a different deal here. And that's that I just get it started. The bale wrap that I'm using right now was the individual wrap bales, they're, they're twine wrapped. And I just cut the top, oh, four or five strings off uh, to get it started. But I try and make it even with how far I pull the bale wrap down. And I'm only coming down that far from the edge. And then you get a, you know, eight, 10, 15 animals around there. They got their head over the top and their chin in there. They just push everything down as they go. So Brooke's question, Jeremy, is how is the grass regrowth on fields that you are hay bombing on? Are you going through and spreading out that hay more in the spring? Okay, so we don't do any mechanical input um, after the high density bale grazing. We just leave that residue. And if we really want to help break it down, we'll concentrate the, the cattle in a tighter paddock on there, increase that stalking density. They're just not on that area as long, but it's it's really interesting. They're curious critters. They come back and and they just almost rework those areas with their hooves. So they really incorporate that residue back into the soil surface. We've Thank actually you. we've actually Perfect. used the cattle to break up um, some areas intentionally that had that were a bomb. Um, put them on at seven hundred fifty thousand pounds or something. It does a really good job of incorporating it. 
Josh's question for tonight is regarding bell grazing in summer. How do you get the animals to eat the belled hay when there is fresh green grass to eat growing all around them? Yeah, I'll take that one. First of all, they need to you need to have that trust relationship with the animals um, that they know they're going to get full rumens every day. Um, second is they need to be trained to polywire that's got enough voltage on it and a good enough ground that they're going to respect it. Um, usually on the part-time hating hay feeding, what I tend to do on those opportunity paddocks, I'm putting good quality stuff out there. I'm not putting junk out there for them. It's decent stuff. And then about one, two o'clock in the afternoon, we go let them into a little paddock for no more than three hours. They don't need water out there. If you're doing dairy, this is super easy because you do it three hours before you milk. Then you bring them in the parlor, you milk them, you send them back out. The gate's already switched and they're going back to where they have decent quality hay, decent quality baleage or whatever, water, mineral, whatever you're going to do in your program out there for them. They're happy cows no matter where they go. Yes, they're very happy to run out there mm -hmm. when you drop that fence for those few hours to get that bite but then you get them back and they should be filling up in that time. You should be giving them enough to filling up, but it's three hours out of a 24 hour period, the rest of it. And they should be going out fairly full anyway, because they're in decent quality feed. Thank you, Kent. So Calvin's question is, do you place round bells on end or on its side when placing bells out? Myself, I put them on the end because my cows would use them like a ball and roll them throughout the field and through fences and creeks and, you guys, I do all mine on the end. I do all mine on the end so I can get the wrap or the twine or whatever's on there off. That's why. And I usually don't put them out until middle to the end of November here in northern Minnesota when we're ready to start getting close to use them. So I don't have to worry about getting five, six, seven, eight inches of rain on them and soaking that up and freezing solid here. We had three inches of rain uh, around Christmas and I had a whole bunch of bales placed on end, and it's just, it, that wasn't even a problem for me. I did go out and remove all the net wrap off those when in the rain, just to make sure they didn't freeze on me, because there's nothing worse than taking twine or net wrap off frozen bales. That is no fun, um, right, Derek? A, it's a nightmare. <laughs> Man, but that's something we need to probably talk about just real quick, like, is is be conscientious of your environment when you place the bales out, how, how soon you place them out prior to grazing, either wind or rain, you know, or moisture in the form of liquid. So just be a little conscientious of, uh, conscientious of that. So John's question tonight is, when you're feeding hay while grazing during the growing season, when do you prefer to put the hay out for them? Before the animals go into the, to the break or after they've grazed it, down to the appropriate level where you don't want them to take off anymore? Kent. Yeah, I usually have plenty for them in the in the paddock that I'm using as an opportunity paddock. If I'm unrolling on the site, that's just going to be part of their their ration. And it's amazing when when we unroll bales in the summer, if they haven't had access to good quality hay or haylage in the summer, how much they'll gravitate towards that. You wouldn't think they'd be interested in it, but something different out there is somehow attractive to them and they like it. And so it's it's pretty interesting to see how they do. You're going to have to make some adjustments if you're going to do this over a few days. But I make sure if I'm using an opportunity paddock and they're out there when they're not out grazing something else for a short period of time, that there's always plenty of feed out there for them. Always. It's it's always there. Thank you, Kent. I see Ike has a question here for, this, for us this evening or a comment. I am doing swath grazing, moving a hot wire every three days. And I always ask myself if the cows eat more than they need compared to feeding a TMR on pasture where I can control them on how much they eat, realizing that there is a cost of running a, running a, mix running a mixer. Jeremy, any thoughts? Um, my thought is, you know, <clears throat> in, in my context, um, the animals will regulate themselves where I can vary that is with the hay quality in his case. Um, if he finds his animals are are getting too heavy or, or he's putting too much weight on or he feels they're consuming too much feed, can he limit feed them with that poly wire? So, you know, you can watch the manure, you can be observant, you can look at their body condition and you can, I mean, he's in a great situation to control the intake just with that poly wire. So it's more than the cost of starting up the mixer wagon. 
It's the cost of putting that feed up, whether you're putting it in a bunker, putting it through a bale wrapper, putting it in a dry hay, whatever, then taking it out again, processing it through the mixer wagon, firing up that tractor and taking it out again. There's a lot of moving, literally moving pieces and parts uh, difference between running it through the mixer wagon and, and doing strut swath grazing. The more frequently you move that poly wire, the better you're going to be able to regulate and control feed intake and feed utilization. So if you're doing it every three days and you're concerned about what they're doing and you think your only other options, the TMR, honestly, I think about going out there every day and moving that poly wire on the strip grazing. That's going to, that's going to, you're going to be on top of what's going on then because you're out there every day. Um, and that's still going to be cheaper than picking it all up packing it, putting it in a bag, whatever, throwing it in the TMR and hauling it back out by a long shot. So Brooks, next question is you have, you may have said this, but how often are you returning to a site to Belgrade? I've heard that you should return to a Belgrade site every four years. Wondering if you are also on this rotation. So it totally depends. A lot of it depends on your soils. Um, there are people on sand type soils, coarse textured soils, they're seeing benefits out four and five years. People on heavier soils or loamier soils, clay-based soils, they're seeing benefits. You can still go out and see where those bell rings were seven, eight, nine years later. I've been doing this long enough. There are sites that, honestly, you're going to be more frustrated with not getting across the entire farm if, if you're in the north. I'm not talking about down in the south like Kentucky or out Maryland or something like that. I'm talking about in you know Wisconsin, Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, whatever. You're going to be frustrated that you aren't getting back to sites fast enough because it's going to take so long to cover the entire farm. You're only covering a small fraction of the farm with something like hay bombing or higher density grazing at using 30 plus bales per acre, it takes a long time to get around the farm. You're going to wish you could move the needle faster. So there are, there are sites, you know, I'm 20 plus years of doing it on this farm and there are sites I am only now going over a second time, but only because I feel they need it. I've got sites I've only hit once in over 20 years. I'd love to get back there sometime, but I'm a ways away from that. I got other sites that, I want to concentrate on. So that's that for most of us in the North country, that's the bigger problem down South where we're doing the lower density grazing, you're going to see where you fed last year. And so you just move it over and feed there and just keep, you can go over it again, you know, again and again, you're just placing those bales in a different place and in a different position. Thank you, Kent. Jeff's question is, we used to bell graze without rings, but during calving season, we had calves lay close to the bales and the cows rolled the bell over onto the calf and killed it. What can be done to prevent that if not using bell rings? Derek. Uh, well, I suppose you calve later when you're not going to use any bales. Um, we haven't run into that problem yet. Um, usually in later spring when we're, we do calve when we're still feeding hay, but, um, it seems to us if we give them enough room, those cows go and find a spot away from everybody else. And uh, we probably, the cows are probably only, well, I, I suppose, let's say a hundred head. We probably on, you have, they have five acres where they can go lay on, you know, all, all the other spots. And we really haven't had any issues with that. Yeah. Give them more space. Rethink calving season, if that's an option for you or, you know, none of this is all or nothing. None of this is all or nothing. It's about being adaptive. And if you are coming up to calving season and you feel you need it because of your context to protect those calves, then put them out there, use them. But you don't have to use them the rest of the winter because it's just extra labor. So save those things, stretch their life because you're only using them part of the season instead of the wear and tear on them from cattle beating on them is going to shorten their life faster than if you only use them part of the year. Save them for that special occasion, that special need. It's like any other tool in the toolbox. Sometimes we got a little dig, dig a little deeper, but I encourage you to think through other options or think about just using it when you absolutely need it. Absolutely. Thank you, Kent and Derek. Jerry's question is, Jeremy, impressive soil test results from bell grazing. Did you have a similar soils test of the field before bell grazing was begun? 
we do have some Haney tests from other places on the farms. Uh, um, our farms, two soil types across 300 acres. So there's not much variation. Um, those two bale grazed areas are dramatically and very impressively better. Um, our natural or our normal organic matter contents four and a half to five percent, and we were double that in those bale grazed areas. Um, you know, that's just one metric that I know off the top of my head. But yes, we are sampling other places on the farm. So the anonymous attendee asked the question, where do you market all your grass finished beef? <laughs> um, so we we sell a lot of our um young stock as either stalkers weaned off the cow for a month or so, let them get adjusted, um, or we direct market locally. And so then we direct market all of our call cows and open heifers, just word of mouth, friends, Facebook marketplace, things like that. So Brad's question is, any problems with deer or, or elk, or do you worry about them, Kent? You know, Jeremy talked about some deer showing up. I have yet to have, I have deer tracks oftentimes within 50 yards, 50 feet even sometimes of the bales. I have yet to have a problem. Our last two winters here in Northern Minnesota were on the tougher side. There was deer sign in the area, but they were not a problem uh, in, in the area. I have just not had a problem with it. I know it can be a problem, but I personally have never experienced a problem. I thought I was going to the last two years, but I didn't. So Dorothy's question is this evening, is it better to bell graze on native grasses or tame grasses, or does it work equally well either way? And I'm just going to talk on this one real quick. When I think native grasses, I'm thinking native warm seasons like we have here in Kansas. And if I am going to bell graze on those native indigenous plants, I'm going to unroll bells. I'm not going to spot bells. Um, I will consider spot bales on tame grasses like smooth brome, um, areas we have in this part of the world, definitely for converting them back into a pasture land. But on, on true natives, true, true indigenous natives, if I was going to bell graze, I'd be unrolling the bells. Jeremy, Kent, I, Derek, your I thoughts? Se I second that, Shane. I second that. Yep. Angie's question is this evening, are there many differences in procedures in utilizing bell grazing in different crop ground, corn versus bean ground versus pasture ground? And Kent, I think you kind of spoke about this just a little bit, talking about- I did, the yeah. Yeah, the rule of thumb is generally on crop ground, we're gonna unroll uh, and it's gonna be better quality stuff that they're probably gonna clean up. Um, save save the bale placement, the putting the whole bales out there, for grazing on pasture sites, avoid hay and cropland. So Jacob's question this evening, what do you recommend to bell graze on fairly steep hills? Jeremy. So I've got some experience with that. We have, um, you know, if you can get equipment on it safely, we've fed big square bales, um, lay them on their side, cut the strings off, let the cattle spread the hay out, the residue out. Um, some of my customers down in Missouri, um, in the Ozarks, We'll set round bales at the top of the hills and just unroll them to the bottom. And that's a great way to do it also. I think it really depends on your context and the amount of effort um, you want to put into it and keeping safety in mind, you know, if the equipment's even an option. I think the key word you just mentioned there, Jeremy, is safety. And it's not only mm -hmm. your own personal safety, but it's animal safety too. Definitely, we get into slick, icy snowpack conditions, animals trying to trail up a, a slick hill and injuring themselves. Jacob's question is, what do you recommend to bell? Oh, excuse me. Sorry, I've already done that one. Got a behind. Can bomb grazing get a person into trouble with manure concentrations, kind of like spreading manure on frozen ground? Jeremy or Ken? Um, I'm going to take a little nibble at this. I'm going to say no, because there's all that carbon there to tie mm -hmm. the nitrogen to. And the potassium from the urine is going to go right down into that soil. Um, because generally, if there's a mat of hay, and and even if it's frozen ground, the ground's going to thaw out underneath that hay, or the the warm urine's going to penetrate into it. So, thoughts, Kent? Yeah, that amount of carbon we're putting out there is key. When we have a high carbon nitrogen ratio, that's a pretty stable environment for that nutrients to stay put. So, John's question this evening is: What is the benefit of unrolling versus leaving the bell without unrolling? It depends so, on your site and your context, what you're trying to accomplish, honestly. 
Um, unrolling is going to take a lot more labor. Where are you doing it? Why are you doing it? Think about why you're doing it. Uh, is that the appropriate technique for your site? I, I think it comes back to what impact you want to have. If you want to have low impact with limited amount of residue, then unroll it. Um, if you don't, if you want a higher impact with more residue, then just set her on in and cut the twine or net wrap and be done with it. Levi's question is, as far as bell grazing on crop ground, do you see a yield drag the first year? Also at a lower density, say five bells per acre, do you see any compaction issues affecting the following crop? Kent. So we usually don't see compaction with the unrolling. And again, I'd encourage you to use something the animals are going to clean up. Bale it your really high quality hay, so we're not going to leave a bunch of stuff. And the key is just keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. You can't keep doing it on the same site. And we will have problems. You, you want to spread the goodness around across that whole field. So Jerry's question is, how far do you feel it, it is acceptable to have wintered cows to walk to fresh water? Anybody? Kent, Derek? Yeah, we've, we've got guys in the Dakotas walking them over a mile. We'll walk close to a mile, um, especially with dry cows intentionally, um, to keep them in good shape physically for calving. And then I believe it leads to low calving or very few calving issues. They're athletes by spring. Muscle, muscle tone does a lot, resolves a lot of problems. Yep. Our cows must be wimps because they're only going a half mile. <laughs> Jerry's question is, I have overgrazed pasture from 30 years ago. All trees are canopied the ground. If thin the stand, if I thin the stand, could I bell under basically how do how to restore oak savannas in southern Wisconsin? Yeah, so thinning I've been a part of a project on that for the last five years. So getting that canopy down, if you're at hundred percent canopy. We want to think about getting down to around 30% canopy. You can use bale grazing. There's probably a late, there's a latent seed bank there between bale grazing and adaptive grazing and thinning that canopy to get some more sunlight down to the ground through those trees. You can restore it pretty fast. Just start on one end, work your way in. Don't try and knock it all out at once unless you're going to have a commercial timber sale. Work your way across it. Make sure you got plenty of rust in there and get out there and observe and watch what happens. Uh, it can be done. It's pretty fun to do. Larry's question is, in feeding that seed-heavy mature hay, do you have to be more concerned with ration balancing? Now we'll address that. Let's look at that for a dairy standpoint real quick. Ken and Derek. I found they balance themselves, um, and we'll just let them leave more behind. We bake our hay on the mature side, mostly baleage, and um, shoot for... 20% refusals of the baleage and the cows do just fine. We've actually found the, the cows will actually milk more when we do it this way versus putting in bale rings on cement or something like that because they're selecting it themselves. And I think there's something to possibly even select it. We feed several varieties of hay at a time and they select um, pot, maybe even the order they eat it in it could, could affect their digestion and stuff too so we've actually seen better results from the more mature stuff yep i concur so yeah. these question go ahead jeremy i was just going to say we um when we feed more mature hay we do it when it's not crazy cold for that net energy of maintenance but we also feed a source of protein you know higher quality baleage and watch the manure and those observations will carry you right through that so we're going to kind of get through some more of these questions here uh, Dorothy's question is, we have a very sandy hill, poor soil conditions, grain crop field that we are considering swath or bell grazing a forage crop on to improve the soil with minimal equipment cost of unrolling and moving bales around. Is this still an option with some residue management or is it better off to unroll process those bales? Myself personally, if I can put some diversity out there, allow it to stockpile. And the key is going to be how you manage the animals through there, making sure you're leaving adequate residue on that soil. Kent, Jeremy? Yeah, you may be better off thinking about a diverse, complex cover crop that you can graze into the winter with a high degree of trample where you're going to consume maybe 30% of it and trample the rest through high stock density grazing to get some armor 
on there and keep that armor and then build your diversity through that complex mix and then use the animals during that dormant season to to get the animal integration out there you may have to do that a couple of years in a row uh you got to watch your herbicide history out there if it's been in row crops for a lot of years to see what we can use so make sure you do a back check at least three years back preferably four and if you can get access to some pack manure uh, to help that cover crop get going that's just more carbon we can get out there uh, Jerry's question is, what tree density can't, should I shoot for on those savannas? Uh, a lot of savannas is three to 10 trees per acre. It depends on the size and the growth and, the, you know, um, that's a big part of it. And it depends on what else is in the stand or nearby. We want to avoid wind throw out there. So without looking at it, I'm giving you some broad guidelines you may need to make some specific tuning to your specific situation, but true savanna is probably running in that three to 10 trees per acre. Ultimately, you may have to do it in stages. Do it a portion at a time. Uh, Troy's question is, in situations where you have already done years of bell grazing, so nutrients are, are already at desired level, do you have a goal for how often you attempt to re-bell graze to main, maintain nutrient levels? Jeremy? I've never got to that point. He's pretty fortunate to be there. Um, you know, I, I think at that point, I would look more at the low impact bale grazing if you're already at those nutrient levels, um, you know, bale unrolling. Um, but, you know, their whole regenerative um, style of farming is a, it's a process. It's not a destination. So, and don't lock into one technique, you know, be adaptive based on your observations. Keep taking your observations and adjust and understand this whole outwintering things, a spectrum of options that are out there and just match it to fit your situation. John Myers just has a comment. I'm just going to read it real quick. Being frustrated with not being able to cover enough area is one of the main reasons he prefers bell and rolling. Even though mm -hmm. I recognize that equipment and labor costs are significantly higher, I try to cover as much ground as possible at least once by enrolling. And I will cover poor soil spots that need improvements numerous times throughout the winter. Sometimes I've covered extremely sandy areas up to four times throughout the winter. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it goes back to everyone's context. I mean, and we got to keep that in mind, your situation. Jeff said the Thanks for the excellent answer. Nicholas, in a 14 inch precipitation area, what density of bells would you use to kickstart expired CRP with low ground cover? I'll, right. I'll start off here real quick. I'd use a, probably a pretty high density in the mm -hmm. initial beginning. Yeah, absolutely. In that 20, 22 bales per acre range, something like that. That's going to put them about on a 30 by 30, 35, 30, 30 to 40 foot spacing, both directions from the bale, something like that. Yeah. So Pete's question is, will bell grazing bring back areas that have been taken over by grease wood and rabbit brush that has little to no native grasses? Go for it. Shove them and shove those bales in there. Start from the edge and keep working it in. You're not going to get it all done in one shot. It might take you a few years, depending on the size, but we've done it in brushy areas. Make the cows work for you. It's amazing what you can do. Uh, Ethan has a question here. Our lease land only has water with one above ground water fed by above ground tanks. Is there a good way to haul water in the winter? Currently considering hauling water into a bunch of troughs and chopping ice daily. Smaller operation twenty head. <clears throat> I would haul her. I would haul what they're going to consume roughly in a day, and you're going to be able to judge every day. You may need two tanks, a little extra on the bottom. Use a black tank if you can put it where the sun can shine on it. It's going to keep it from thawing. Fill it early. You know when the sun's up or when you know it's daylight. Don't try not to leave it overnight. You they can be trained to drink when they need to. And how much they drink is going to vary depending on snow cover, moisture content, the vegetation, precipitation that's out there that's coming down. And then are you using dry hay or are you using baleage? 
um, all those things uh, influence that. And that's something if you're out there daily, you can judge and ad adjust. I've done it. We hauled out in the morning. Um, I tried to leave four to five inches in the bottom of a tank. I used all black tanks, hauled once a day. It worked great. They came up and drank what they needed. Everybody was fine with a little extra just in case I was off. So Ethan has another question. You support unrolling on true warm season native grasses. What are the negative effects of bell grazing on true warm season natives? Well, part of the negative effect yeah. is you could kill out some of those native species um, okay. by getting too much armor on top of those soils. So obviously we're trying to protect <laughs> the existing forages that are there and not trying to- you're also, Go ahead, Kent. Yeah, you're going to stimulate, You're if there's any- cool season non-natives like brome or Kentucky blue or quack or something like that, you're going to stimulate that because they're nitrogen loving. You're putting a bunch of nitrogen out there. They get that moisture on the spring. Poof. You've already suppressed the natives. That stuff's going to take off. So it's just going to get out ahead of all the natives. We're going to do a couple more here guys and being respectful of everyone's time this evening. So does anyone have experience supplementing 400 pound calves with grain put on top of rolled out hay? We've done it with young stock before. It works just fine. Um, even just doesn't even have to be on top of the hay. Be on top of the snow, frozen ground. They lick it up fine. It's, it works fine. Put Not it on somewhere color, clean. Smaller, smaller go. Yeah, put it somewhere clean is the big thing. So real quick here, if we were to plant in an annual forage for cover crop, grazing, swath grazing, what forages do you recommend so they will be utilized? So they will utilize it well in Western North Dakota, Kent. Western North Dakota. Okay, so I'd look at pH. I'd look at herbicide history. Uh, I'd look at what you want to do with that field in the subsequent year. Do you want to move it to perennials or do you want to continue it as a crop ground? Um, there, There's green cover seed has an online cover crop calculator. You can go in and answer some questions and play some what-if scenarios there and decide some of it's going to winter kill, and that's great. Maybe you want it all to winter kill, but I would think about putting some things in there like kale or some of the other brassicas that are going to stick around uh, to very cold temperatures, so you're going to keep your protein levels up in there. It will diminish in protein over the season, so you're going to want to feed it earlier. Your energy is the first thing that goes, protein second, um, as that decomposes. But a good diverse mix. Um, we could put a lot of different things in there depending on your site. Everything from oilseed sunflowers to brassicas to sorghum sedans and millets, even corn uh, on some of those sites. And, and then we need to think about when you're going to plant it and then what you have to plant it with. So there's a lot of questions we'd want to ask to really give you some specifics. But if you can answer those questions um, and then go to that green cover seed smart mix calculator, it's a free online tool that you can use. I think you can get a, do a pretty good job of coming up with something that would work for you. Well, Larry's question is, when you talk about seed bank, how deep can you expect an affected <laughs> seed bank? And you know, that's going to re be a reflection on how good a job do you do at building soil aggregation and, and, and that seed bank. One trick we do when we bell graze, we wherever our perimeter fencing is, we try to put a poly wire 20, 30 feet away from the perimeter fence so the cattle aren't grazing those areas. And we let that seed, that grass is there, go to seed to help move into the bell grazed areas. It all goes back to building soil aggregation, the depth of soil aggregation from helping the encourage the latent seed bank or that soil aggregation allowing new seeds to germinate. Kent, Jeremy, any comments? Derek? I think you got it. Andy's question. Are your neighbors imitating your bell grazing techniques or are you the crazy farmer wasting hay? Curious <laughs> if it is similar to what my neighbor's response will be. Well, I yep. was that crazy neighbor 25 years ago, but not anymore. Um, I do enough workshops where we talk about this and I almost always ask at the beginning, who's doing it and how do you like it? And the typical response I get is why weren't we doing this 40 years ago? It's one of the best things I've done for my operation. And usually once somebody starts doing it, we've got enough people in North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, Manitoba doing it now. 
very few people are the crazy neighbor and even the crazy one's the one who's not doing it. There's almost enough pressure out there for that. So be that crazy neighbor, teach your neighbors how to do it. Uh, you're going to help them stay in farming a lot longer by helping them learn how to do this. Uh, Unless can... you want to buy their farm and you want them to go broke, then don't well, show them how to do it. But Let's keep that to ourselves, Kent. Okay, <laughs> we're going to wrap up with this question here this evening. Just want to share my first experience experimenting with bell graze in Alberta last winter. I did a mix of unrolling and whole bells on a small section of pasture that had been grazed as flat as a pool table that summer. Some areas where the hay was unrolled in the colder parts of winter, the snow was licked clean of almost any hay residue. And later in the winter, when things were warming up, they left more residue. When the grass started growing, those heavy looking mats of hay residue were being lifted right up off the ground by the grass growing beneath it, throughout it. So, I mean, it just, it just shows, you know, really most people when they see bell grazing, I mean, it depends on how you do the technique and stuff. You think you're wasting a lot of hay, but you'll be amazed how little of that hay is really actually there when green up does occur. And I guess I'll wrap up with this last question from Jerry. Anyone successfully bell grazing bull groups? Mm -hmm. Yes. Very, that's very popular. Yes. Um, sometimes because it's so convenient to bale graze them, we kind of forget we have them. <laughs> that's the group a lot of people start with if they've got multiple yeah. classes of it. That's the one they start with. So absolutely. So Jeremy Kent. Great job tonight, tonight's presentation. We want to thank everyone for all their questions and for attending. Um, well done, guys. So thank everyone for attending this evening. Look forward to our next webinars that are coming up here in the near future. So everybody have a good evening and stay safe. Thank you, guys. Thanks, folks.